On April 7th of 2021, the U.S. Department of Energy's Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory released an amazing press release. This press release detailed the first results from Fermi Labs Muon G-2 or perhaps G2 experiment and it, uh, it indicated the possibility that for the first time the standard model of particle physics did not explain a set of results accurately. As you might imagine this result has set the physics community and much of the scientific community ablaze with conversation and speculation and a number of other things to sort of try to figure out what exactly this means. With this in mind and the fact that this podcast spent a good bit of time talking about um, the history of the atom in human thought and just the whole idea of the standard model of particle physics, I thought we would take some time to go over what those results were, place them in context, and sort of understand kind of where we're going with this and what it all means. So, over the course of this next, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, we're going to try to take a look at what's going on with this and see if we can give you some information as to whether you think the entire universe has been changed as some press releases or some media sources are claiming, or if the results here should be taken with a little more caution and maybe just a bit of skepticism. So, tighten your uh, seat belts, put on your crash helmet, because we're going to take a quick tour through the, the, uh, the world again of particle physics and uh, what this all means in this episode of the Scientific Odyssey. Hello and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. The Scientific Odyssey Unscripted, the Muon G2 Experiment Results, and the Standard Model of Particle Physics. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Scientific Odyssey. This was completely unplanned um, until just a couple of days ago, four days ago to be exact. I'm recording this on April 11th, and as I mentioned in the intro four days ago, the folks at Fermilab introduced or announced a result that has uh, really kind of gotten quite a bit of press coverage, and I thought it'd be useful for us to take some time to, to talk a little bit about it in place of what we might normally have done, which is our continuation of the, the history of cartography. We'll have that, that episode in a couple of weeks. Instead, I thought I would take some time to talk about this because, as you might imagine, this is getting a lot of, of play in, in not just scientific media sources, but, you know, I've seen articles in things like The Atlantic and Salon and, and a number of other things. And so um, I thought it would be useful for us to talk a little bit about this, as I've, I've said. Um, and what I would like to really talk about this in terms of is, is do that kind of almost 360 degree perspective on this, not just talk about the results or just their implications, but tie in some of the, the discussion that we've had in the past um, to this on, um, on how science gets done and what this means and model building and, and all of those sorts of things that are just sort of the, I think hopefully you've come to recognize as a staple of this podcast. As I always say in these episodes, this is completely unscripted. I haven't written a script for this thing as I often do for our, our more traditional episodes. Hopefully I won't make any major, major mistakes, but it always seems the case. I'm sure I'm going to get some number wrong about this or some small detail, and I apologize for that in advance. I'm working just from, from what limited notes I've been able to cobble together, including the Fermilab press release and a couple of other things. Um, for those of you who haven't done so already, and, and maybe this is the first exposure you have to our podcast, do know that we do an entire series on you know, the history of the atom. And, you know, the, the latter part of that series, we spent an awful lot of time talking about 
you know, the, the lead up and the build up to what we now call the standard model of particle physics. Um, if you were interested in this kind of thing, I would really recommend you go back and, and start from the beginning. While the, the sound quality on some of those early episodes isn't the greatest, I apologize for that. I just haven't had time to get back and do re-recordings of some of those episodes. Um, I think you'll find the content will be really helpful and it'll build some con, you know, some context and perspective as we go through this. So anyway, let's go ahead and, and jump in and, and talk a little bit about what's going on here. Just you've heard the quick introduction. And so, you know, the, the experiment's called the muon G2 or G-2, and I haven't been able to run down exactly what that's called. So I'm just going to call it the muon G2 experiment. And I'll sort of talk about why it's called that here in a few minutes. Um, this is actually an experiment that's a continuation of an experiment that was actually started way back in 2001 at Brookhaven National Laboratory, where they did some similar kinds of work, but they don't have, you know, the ability to produce muons, and we'll talk about what those are in a moment as well, to, at, at nearly the rate and at nearly the level as the Fermilab facility. And so... The Fermilab facility has is, is, is announced these results, and combined with the results from the Brookhaven experiment, we're really getting close to a point where we, we really think there's some, some groundbreaking physics going on here. So with that having been said, let me kind of transition for a minute into sort of setting up some background and context. What this all comes down to is this thing that we call the standard model or the standard model of particle physics. Those are the, the two most common names that you'll hear, you know, hear this, this model called. And it's really sort of our theoretical structure that explains our understanding at this point based off of our experimental or observational results of how matter in the universe is put together. Okay, And that's really what the standard model is. And so the standard model basically says... There are two kinds of basically chunks of matter that you find in the universe. You can sort of break them into a couple of different parts or a couple of different types, I should say. The first are called fermions and the second are called bosons. What distinguishes a baryon, baryon or excuse me, a fermion and a boson from each other is this property that we call spin, right? And it's this this property that some or that all matter can have. Fermions have have spin that we kind of sort of quantify when you get into the mathematical models and in in terms of what we call half integers in other words that spin value can be one half three halves negative one half negative three halves something like that you'll hear it called half integer spin bosons are particles that have what we call integer spin negative one zero positive one things like that and so those are the two types of, of particles that we will see in nature. And it turns out each of these types of particles has a role they play in sort of setting how, na how nature works. Now, one of the things I always like to talk just a little bit about, and I talked about this in, the, in that series quite a bit, is the model I teach my students quite a bit. And this, again, is the model, right? And that is, is that I sort of say what you have is matter is made up of chunks of matter and each chunk of matter can have a variety of different properties it may not have those properties so you know it can have rest mass it can have charge it can have spin it can have this thing we call color right it can have all of these properties and what those properties do is it determines how that chunk of matter interacts with other chunks of matter so when we talk about chunks of matter and we're talking about fermions, it turns out there are 12 types or 12 chunks of matter that we identify as fermions. Everything in the universe gets built out of a combination of these 12 chunks of matter. One set of chunks, six of these, we call quarks, right? And it turns out these are the, the building blocks of what we call hadrons, right? Things like protons and neutrons, those sorts of things. They're built out of quarks. Some of the really interesting physics that's coming out of the Large Hadron Collider in, in CERN is that we're beginning to see, you know, we used to sort of think that, that quarks could only combine in two ways. You could have particles that were made of three quarks, protons, neutrons, you know, and we call those baryons. Then you've got types of matter that are made out of only two types of quarks, and those are called mesons, right? So those kinds of ideas, 
that's sort of the quark side of things. And that tends to be the type of matter we interact with most often in our everyday life, right? You sort of think about, you know, if you took a, a chemistry class, you've done a little reading on this, you already know that, you know, most of the matter that we talked about, you know, is, is atomic in nature. And, you know, the nucleus of the atom is made of protons and neutrons. Those are baryonic forms of matter. They're made of, you know, each of those particles are made of three quarks. Turns out, though, that the second type of matter that is what we call fermions are what we call leptons, right? We have all these weird names for these things, but leptons are another fundamental particle, and leptons don't combine with other leptons to form things, right? They just sort of stay by themselves. Best example of um, a lepton that you know everyone's familiar with is an electron. An electron is a type of lepton, and note, you can't build particles, other particles, out of just um, electrons, right? Um, that's just not something that you can do. You can combine leptons with other baryons like we do in atoms, and you can form atoms out of those. But the lepton itself doesn't combine with other leptons. And it turns out there are six leptons. There's the electron. There's its beefier cousin we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today, the muon. Then there's what's called the tau particle. And then each of those three has a neutrino associated with it. And we talked a little bit about neutrinos and, and sort of their first sort of, you know, Wolfgang Pauli putting these forward because he couldn't get some of the equations to balance correctly when he was doing his work in, in, in various reactions in particle physics back in the, the 1920s and early 1930s. And so he posits the existence of these particles called neutrinos. They're neutral. They don't have the property we call charge, right? And, you know, they're carrying off energy and all of those sorts of things. So that's that first type of particle. The second type of particle, what we call bosons, these are the types of particles that are carrying the, the what sometimes you learn call them forces. I like the term interactions. And there are four fundamental interactions we, we talk about in the universe. We can talk about the gravitational interaction. We can talk about the electromagnetic interaction. We can talk about the weak interaction. We can talk about the strong interaction, right? And it turns out that, you know, the, the particles that carry or sort of, you know, mediate these interactions, we call those bosons. And so a photon is the, you know, the boson that mediates the electromagnetic interaction. The W and Z particles do that for the weak interaction. Gluons do it for the um, strong interaction. And then maybe there are these things called gravitons that do this for the for the gravitational interaction. We also, you know, very, you know, in the last decade or so, of course, the discovery of the Higgs boson, which talks about how you can you you cup you can couple these part some of these particles with what's known as the Higgs field, and that gives these particles the property we call mass, right? So that's sort of the explanation of the standard model. And the standard model sort of is all of the math that goes with this sort of describes how all of these particles and in these these force carriers they interact to produce all of the things we see around us in the universe right except that we know or we have a sense anyway that the standard model of particle physics is not a complete model it doesn't explain everything and there's a couple of things. First off, when we, we, we start doing cosmological models, like the Lambda CDM model that we talked about at the end of our third season in, in finding our place in the universe, one of the things that we know is that there seem to be particles, what we call dark matter, that don't seem to be fitting into the standard model of particle physics. The other thing is the standard model of particle physics, we just don't seem to be able to figure out how to include that fourth interaction gravitation into the standard model of particle physics. So a couple of other things about the particle, the standard model we should talk a little bit about. One, it's a completely what we call quantized model. In other words, it, it's governed by the rules of quantum mechanics. Things come in discrete chunks. You don't have continuous natures of things, those sorts of things. Whereas when we talk about gravitation, and this is one of the differences, gravitation, there isn't the quantized version of a gravitational theory. Einstein's general theory of relativity is a continuous field equation approach to describing gravitation. And the thing that's really interesting is these two approaches you would think would be pretty incompatible. And in a sense, they, I don't want to say they're incompatible, but they, they definitely aren't integratable. You can't integrate at this point, we can't integrate gravitation into these models that, that include you know, electromagnetic and, and weak interactions, we've already figured out how to unify those, but then also the strong interaction. 
And so because of that, what we know is that there's got to be an issue. The problem is, is that up until this point, when we try to push these models into making predictions where we think the model will fail, neither of those two models, the general theory of relativity, standard model of particle physics, neither of those two models fails ever. Well, until maybe now. And that's what this is all about. That's what this whole conversation, this whole big thing is about, is that when we talk about the standard model of particle physics, it makes very, very precise predictions about what we should measure when we do certain types of experiments. And every single time we've asked the standard model to make that prediction and we work out the calculation and that prediction is made, and then we go and we make the measurement, the measurement we make comes out exactly the way the prediction says it will. And that's problematic because we know these cannot be two complete theories or models or whatever we want to call them, right? They can't be because they're not integratable. They're, you know, they don't, the, you, you can't put them together to form what is oftentimes called a grand unified theory. So because of that, we know that this, that one or both of these models has to have things wrong with them but that we don't know what they are because they have up until now always worked in making correct predictions. And this is a good place, I think, for us to take a little bit of a divergence here or a little, little digression and do a little philosophy of science. One of the things, and I can certainly remember when I was a student here or a student early in my scientific career and probably all through my undergraduate years, I don't think this was ever really, it never sank in. It probably Someone probably told me this and it just never sank in because I'm dense. But the idea that you, you taught early on that science is a conformational process, that what you do is you make a hypothesis or you have a hypothesis, that description of the system that allows you to make predictions about the behavior of the system, right? And that you're going to make those predictions. And when you make those predictions, you're then to see the, you're going to test those predictions to see if it comes out correctly. It's conformational in its approach. And as we've talked about in our, our series on the problem of induction, it turns out, you know, while that certainly works as a method, it is not the most effective way to do this. As Karl Popper sort of writes in his work in philosophy of science, he talks a lot about this idea that what we really need to do is we really need to shoot for falsification. We need to come up with what are called strong tests or hard tests of our, you know, high, you know our hypothesis that push the hypothesis to give us a, a result that is not the one predicted by the hypothesis. And the example I used back then is if, you know, you have Kepler's universal law, or not universal, excuse me, but three laws of planetary motion. And one of the laws of planetary motion says that all planets move in ellipses around the sun with the sun at one focus of that ellipse. The thing that's really interesting about that is, is once you find a couple of planets that do that, finding more planets doesn't actually establish your hypothesis, or in this case, your law of planetary motion, any more accurately, because you've already established that works for a certain number of these. What you really want to do is go out and try to find planets that don't do that and see what happens, or find other astronomical objects in trajectories through space that don't follow those rules. You know, maybe you find one that's moving in a circle, or maybe one's got a hyperbolic orbit or something like that. And that, when you find that, that tells you, in a sense, where your hypothesis, your model, your law, your theory, whatever you might have, tells you where that model fails and that it is in need of modification. And oftentimes gives you a really good sense of the direction of that modification. Okay? So that's the context that you really have to have here. We talked a little bit about, in, in one of our episodes in that, that History of the Atom series, we talked about this really seminal experiment that was done in 1947. And it's known as the Lamb-Rutherford experiment. Um, it was first um, sort of um, thought up by a guy named Willis Lamb. And the, the, the reason this is such a great example is because there's, there are just a ton of analogies between what happened in 1947 and what was going on, what's going on now. By 1947, you know, this, the, 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 the most successful theory, if you want to call it that, 
um, the most successful description of particle interactions in nature was was sort of provided by something known as the Dirac equation, of course, developed by the, the, the great physicist Paul Dirac. And Dirac's discussion is his, his model, which was really a relativistic version of the Schrodinger equation, was an improvement on the Schrodinger equation to take into account the fact that when we we're trying to figure out what's going on with electrons and their motion around atoms, electrons are moving at very high speeds, at relativistic speeds. And so if you really want to get the really, really accurate results, you have to use relativistic, the relativistic version of the Schrodinger equation, which is the Dirac equation. Now, Dirac does this in the late 1920s. And from the late 1920s up into, you know, 1947, the Dirac equation, every time it made a prediction about something and you went to test that prediction, it got it right. The thing is, is just like in this case, it was known that the Dirac equation had gaps in it. it there were things it didn't account for very well. But every time you would calculate, okay, you know, what, what was going to be, you know, you know, this constant or this thing or how many antimatter particles or whatever, the Dirac equation would always seem to correctly predict that until this experiment in 1947. And that experiment on the, the in 1947 really was looking at the, 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 the spectrum produced by the hydrogen atom in the microwave portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the thing is, is that what's really interesting is, is that... Um, the, uh, the, the Dirac equation said that if you put these hydrogen atoms in a really strong magnetic field, that shouldn't make any difference as to what that spectrum should look like. Well, that's, of course, what um, the Lamb and Rutherford did is they put their hydrogen in a really, really high magnetic field with really, really good detectors. And what they found out was that those spectral lines would shift okay, that there would be differences in energy levels that shouldn't be there according to the Dirac equation. In other words, they created an experiment with the expressed purpose of trying to show the Dirac equation would give an incorrect prediction. And then when it did, in a sense, they broke the Dirac equation. But that's a good thing because it was understood that the Dirac equation didn't explain things well enough. And so by breaking the Dirac equation for the first time, some, you know, 20 years after Dirac first wrote it down or so, they were able to provide a guidance as to, wait a minute, how can we modify or change the Dirac equation so that we get a better and more complete understanding of what's going on in the physics of the universe? And that's what opens up, that kind of opens the door for, for guys like Schwinger and Tomonaga and Feynman to do their work in renormalization. It gives them the guidance as to the kind of results they should get out of their calculations because they have, whatever they do has to account for what's known as this Lamb shift, right? So that, of course, by breaking the Dirac equation experimentally, that opens doors to, for things to discover you know, new things to discover and for progress to get made. And that's sort of Popper's point when he's writing about how important falsification is in science. Science, at least, you know, once you, after you get your first sort of confirmational result, after that, you really need to be pushing towards falsification rather than confirmation as a much more powerful tool to make progress. Okay, so that's, you know, really a, a, a big deal. Right. And so let's go ahead and see if we can sort of move forward just a little bit and, and start talking about what's going on with this, this experiment. And to do that, the first thing that we really have to do is sort of talk about this thing that we call the muon. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that music. That, that just is really funky. Again, thanks to the guys at the Blue Dot Sessions for, for letting us use that. Anyway, so what's, what's a muon? Muon, again, it's a, it's a lepton. It's a fundamental particle of, of nature. And let's just talk a little bit about what we know about the, the muon. Muon basically looks exactly like an electron. It's got the, the same charge, negative, you know, we call it negative one of the elementary charge. This is the same spin of it being one half, 
but it's got a couple of really important differences. First off, it's about 200 times more massive, give or take, than the electron. It's, it's a much more massive particle than the electron in that sense. But the other thing is, is it's not stable, okay? Because of the fact that in a sense, it represents a higher particle energy state and nature hates to have higher particle energy states, it is an unstable particle and will decay into other subatomic particles in, you know, normally if it's just sitting in, in a vacuum in about 2.2 microseconds, okay? So it's not a stable particle in that sense. So if you want to do observations of these guys, you've got to be producing them all the time, right? You've got to have something going on that you produce all of the time that's, that's going on with that. Okay. Now a little bit of the history. Um, these things were first discovered. Um, we talked a little bit about this. Carl Anderson and Seth Niedermeyer at Caltech discovered these in 1936 by studying cosmic radiation. Basically what you get is you get cosmic rays coming in. These are very energetic types of electromagnetic radiation. They come in and they interact with atoms in the upper atmosphere. And in that interaction, what they do is they produce these muons at very, very high velocities. And one of the things that's really interesting about these really, really high velocity muons is that, that because they're moving at relativistic speeds and you get things like time dilation taking place, they actually can make it all the way down to the surface of the earth or, or to at least the high mountains, which is of course, or balloons. If you're taking, you know, hot air balloons up to higher parts of the atmosphere, you can find these things on, on, in various, you know, forms of detection. And that's of course what Anderson and Niedermeyer did. Um, in terms of, of this kind of thing. Now, um, because of that, they're, they're really interesting. And like we talked about, because they're so much like the electron, the thing that's great about studying the, these guys is that they don't move around nearly as much, right? Electrons are super light, so they, they accelerate enormously rapidly when there's any kind of a, a force exerted on them something with 200 times the mass of that isn't going to accelerate as quickly. And so these become a pretty ideal type of particles of study for those sorts of reasons. So the thing that's interesting here is that both of these particles, the electron and the muon, and from here on out, we'll just focus on the muon, have this sort of a interesting property, this idea that they have intrinsic angular momentum, what we call spin, right? And then they also have sort of what's called an intrinsic magnetic moment. In other words, and that's a big fancy way of basically saying they act like teeny and, you know, I got to be careful about what I'm going to say here, but let me say it first and then I'll sort of back myself away from this a bit. And that is, is they act like teeny tiny little bar magnets with a north and a south end. Now I say that, and then you got to be a little bit careful and you got to walk that back a little bit. And the reason is, is that as Niels Bohr talks about, you know, in, in talking about the Copenhagen interpretation of, of quantum mechanics, what he says is that this is all quantum mechanical stuff. And the rules of quantum mechanics, we don't necessarily really know what's going on there because we only have classical physics ideas that allow us to describe these things. So what we tend to use is we tend to use these classical analogs and assume or sort of use them to describe quantum mechanical properties and that correspondence may not be as one-to-one -one as we like. A great example is just, you know, you think of, you know, when you talk about spin and you think, you know, of a ball spinning on its axis and, oh, well, that's what the electron's doing. And it turns out that's not a bad model to have, but that's actually not what the electron's doing for a whole variety of reasons that we talk about in an earlier episode. So understand when I say that, that that little, um, that little sort of that, idea of that being a little bar magnet is a, is a simplified model, but it's one that's pretty useful. Okay. And so in a sense, the simplified bar magnet, one of the things it wants to do is it sort of wants to line up with an external magnetic field. So the idea here is, is that, you know, if you take a muon and you put it in an external magnetic field, it should try to line up in some sense with that external magnetic field. Now, the thing is, is that, you know, when you do this, you know, you don't have all of your, your muons initially aligned. And so what's going to happen is it turns out that that little bar magnet doesn't just straight line up because these, these muons in a sense are spinning, if you want to call it that. 
What that means is, is that, of course, since they're spinning, that bar magnet doesn't align. And so what the, what the muon will do in the presence of an external magnetic field is that it will sort of wobble. Is it, it's what the, you hear it all is with the fancy term is it's called precession. And it's this idea if you've ever seen a top that's sort of tilted over a little bit on one side. In other words, it's not straight up and down. You've got a gyroscope or a top, right? And it's spinning real fast, but it's over on the side. What you'll notice is the axis of rotation will sort of turn around whatever the tip of that top is sitting on, right? In other words, this top will sort of, will sort of process or sort of revolve around an axis. Well, that's kind of what these muons are going to do. And so it turns out that the Dirac equation builds into, you know, he's kind of got this thing built in. It's, a, it's able to predict what that value of sort of a value for that precession is supposed to be. And it turns out that if you could put that thing, those, a single muon in that, you know, that vacuum, and there was nothing else in the vacuum, the number we used to quantify that should be two, right? And it, you know, how we use that number to quantify that isn't so important for our discussion. So I won't go into that here. But what happens is one of the things that you sort of know when you're doing these is you know that's actually not the number you're going to get. What there's going to be is there's going to be a small anomaly to that number. And the reason for that small anomaly is this. Turns out, and by the way, we're bringing in everything from that, from that, you know, that later part of the history of the atom series here. We know that due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, not only can you not quantify the position and momentum of a particle, both of those things with infinite accuracy, but you can't do that for energy and time. Energy and time turn out to be a, a, another pair of variables in a Poisson bracket that doesn't come out to be zero like you would expect it to be in classical physics. And what this means is, is what the universe can sort of do is it can, for really short periods of time, borrow energy from itself. And what we know from, of course, relativistic physics is if you can borrow energy, energy and mass are equivalent. So by borrowing that energy, you can use that energy to create particles. And these particles will exist for just really tiny short periods of time, and then they, they wink out of existence because you can only have them there for that little short period of time. But while they're in existence, they can interact with particles that are really there, right? Um, sometimes you'll hear these called, you know, sort of you know, what we call real particles and virtual particles. Now, the term for all of these, these virtual particles popping in and out of existence in a vacuum is sometimes called quantum foam. I've heard it called that in, in some cases and in some respects. But if you stick this muon that's supposed to process in a strong magnetic field in a vacuum, it turns out that that number, because of the interaction with all these particles that are blipping in and out of existence all, of, all the time, that number is slightly different. How different? About one part in 1,000. So the, what's, what's sort of the, the G factor that's sort of accepted as a theoretical, you know, if you sit down and you do all the calculations with the standard model of particle physics and everything else, that number should come out to be about um, 2.00233 and a bunch of other stuff. And I, that other stuff turns out to be super important here, okay? So the fact that, you know, you're going to go out to many, many places of, of you know, sort of a significant figures there is really a big deal. Okay. So now what the guys first in Brookhaven in 2001, and then now in Fermi lab in 2021, 20 years later, what they've gone is they wanted to go out and measure that magnetic moment in a sense that G factor, excuse me, and that the, the the, the sort of the difference that it's supposed to have from the predicted Dirac value when there isn't a quantum phone, they wanted to go in and measure that super, super carefully. And in 2001, the Brookhaven experiment showed that there was a difference, that the number that they got for this, this G factor for the muon was just a little tiny bit different than the number they were supposed to get based off the theoretical calculations. The problem, if you want to call it that, and we're going to get into this here in a few minutes, sort of talking about how you interpret these results. The problem is, is they couldn't get enough data to confirm that for everybody else's suggestion. They had enough data to say, we might have something here, 
but we don't know. So 20 years later, the Fermi Lab Group does this does a similar type of experiment where they're going to measure this G factor. And they've the Fermi Lab accelerator up there, in, you know, outside of Chicago in the United States. Um, they can produce muons in just enormous, enormous numbers because it's such a powerful particle accelerator. It was the most powerful particle particle accelerator in the world until the CERN Large Hadron Collider got built. Okay. And so what they have done is they've gone out and made a measurement as well. And it turns out their measurement really kind of overlaps the Brookhaven measurement, but it's significantly different from what the standard model predicts. And that's a big deal. So now what we got to do is we sort of got to figure out what that actually means in terms of does this count as a discovery of some sort? And the answer is not yet. Okay. And this is the thing we really need to talk a little bit about in particle physics. Um, in particle physics, the thing that you're doing here is, is you're trying to measure enormously small numbers with incredible precision. And you've got all of this machinery. You've got these detectors and you've got the wiring to the detectors and you've got all the machinery that's running the, the beams that, that produce the particles and all of this other stuff. And all of this, no matter how hard you try, produces some noise. This is a great story. My, you know, my first year of doing experimental work in graduate school, I was, I was part of a project. We were looking for this dark matter candidate called Naxion. And so it turns out the idea with that is, is you think that there's this sort of dark matter candidate that very weakly couples with the electromagnetic field. And if it does, it'll decay and it'll give off some energy. And so what you do is you build this great big antenna and you stick it in the middle of a giant electromagnet. And what you hope is if there's some axions around, they will interact with the magnetic field from that giant electromagnet. They will decay and the energy from that decay will be picked up by your antenna. The problem is, is all of that stuff produces noise. So you've got to minimize that noise so that if there's a signal that comes out of that, you can see the signal. So what we did is we immersed all of this stuff in liquid helium at about 2.4 Kelvin, right? To get rid of all the therm or as much of the thermal and electronic noise. And we didn't just, you know, immerse the electromagnet and the antenna in that. We actually had an amplifier that sat up on top of the antenna that actually got dunked in the, the doer of liquid helium as well so that the thermal noise and the electronics of the amplifier would be minimized, right? That's the kind of thing that you deal with in these kinds of particle physics experiments. And the thing is, is that there's still noise. So what you do is you've got to sort of look to see the signal come up out of the noise and how much does that count? Well, the idea is you base this in a sense on how probable is it, is it that your signal is going to come out to be, um, uh, you know, due to real physics instead of what we might ca call random physics. So probably the best sort of thing is to, to use a, a simpler analogy here just a little bit and see if I can find my resource here. So yeah, let's say, you know, you've got a coin, you, you know, you've got a quarter or whatever, and you're going to flip that coin and you've got a head side and a tail side, right? And you're going to say, okay, I'm going to flip that coin and what are the chances that that coin's going to come up one or 10 heads in a row. Okay. My, you know, experiment says, you know, let's say you're doing some experiment with this coin and you flip the coin in these conditions, it should always come up heads. And so I'm going to flip the coin 10 times and see what it comes up. And let's say it comes up heads all 10 times. And you say, well, look, that confirms my experiment, except that it, or my prediction, I should send out my experiment. You would say my experiment confirms my prediction, except that it doesn't. Because it turns out that if you were just to randomly flip a coin 10 times in about one in every little more than a thousand times that you did that, you would get all, you would get all 10 times you flip the coin would come up heads just based on random events. Okay. So the thing is, is it turns out that in a sense, the way you sort of characterize that then is what you're saying is there's a one in 1000 chance that my result is actually due to random circumstance, due to noise in a sense.
Well, for scientific discovery, that's not good enough. And so the idea you look at is it's, you, you use this idea of what are known as standard deviations. And again, I don't want to get into all the mathematics for this, but the idea is, is that, you know, when you talk about one standard deviation, it's 68% of your data, two standard deviations, is 95, three standard deviations is 98. You can sort of work out from there. The gold standard in particle physics to say that you've actually discovered something is that you have to have a five sigma result. Five sigma in this thing is basically saying you have a one in three million, 30 million chance that your result was a statistical fluke. So the question is, have these guys, you know, first at Brookhaven and now at Fermilab, have they reached the five sigma mark? And the answer is no, they have not re reached the five sigma mark. So it turns out if you sort of look at the data of each of these individually, you end up with the data for each of these individually, given the number of data points that they have, somewhere between 3.2 and 3.5, 3.7, somewhere like that in each individual experiment. But if you're relatively clever, you can take the results of the two experiments, combine them in a way that is legitimate and valid. And what we're at is we're at about sigma of 4.2 still not that gold standard. We still can't say that we have discovered something that the standard model didn't predict. We're close, but we're not quite there yet. So what does that mean? As we sort of get towards the end of this podcast, let's talk a little bit about what this means. First off, you know, one of the things that was really interesting and in working, you know, when they were working at CERN and they were looking for ways to break standard model of particle physics to see if something like supersymmetry or something like that was actually a better model. One of the things that would happen a lot was they would get these three sigma results. Oh, look, it looks like we could be discovering a new particle. And then they would collect a bunch more data and then the bump would just disappear. That new particle they thought they were seeing in an energy spectrum, which shows up as a bump in the spectrum, would just disappear. That happened a lot of times at CERN. So, you know, one of the things you do is you say, okay, well, if they don't have five, why are they publishing this? Why, you know, why was this published in the physical review letters? Well, the reason is, is that, you know, this happens a lot. You wanna let folks know what you're doing. We've talked a little bit about this in terms of scientific communication. Inside of these laboratories, right, in all of the national labs in the United States, this happens at CERN, they have internal publications that people doing work and research and analysis can publish their stuff in so that their immediate colleagues get a sense of what's going on. They can see what's happening. And so, you know, for every one of those three sigma bumps, there was a little bit of a blurb put in a communication saying, hey, we got a three sigma bump, but this energy what could that mean and then all the you know a bunch of theorists that had some extra time i go oh what would that possibly be you know that's just part of the whole scientific conversation when you get to this point the reason they're publishing this is now that you know the folks at fermi lab are really saying look we're getting tantalizingly close here's how we're doing our experiment here's how we're setting up our detectors here's how we're doing all of the stuff if anybody else wants to get up in on the game you're not wasting your time at this point Okay, and that's sort of why you would get that result out there. So what could be our outcomes on this? Well, one, it could be we're at 4.2. We gather a whole bunch more data. You know, we've been getting all these heads and we're getting all these heads and we're getting all these heads when we flip the coin and all of a sudden we start getting a lot more tails, a lot more tails and a lot more tails and the bump, you know, that sigma just disappears and it's gone. Okay, and it turns out you don't have any result. Second possibility, right? And this is, you know, this is, I want to talk about these possibilities in this way because there's so much noise in the media right now about how, oh, this could be the discovery of some new physics, which it might be, but I want to get some groundwork laid before that, before we get to that. The second thing that might happen here is it may be that, you know, and by the way, as I, you know, we talked a little bit about this just a second ago, once this result got sort of put out there, all the theorists are now going back and they are recalculating based on the standard model in excruciating detail by a bunch of different independent groups that aren't communicating with each other if the predicted anomaly from the standard model is actually what it's supposed to be and someone hasn't forgotten to put something in or left something out or whatever. This happens sometimes, right? You can go in there and you make an approximation here, you do a little thing here and think, oh, that's not going to make a big difference. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, wait a minute, maybe that was a bigger deal than I thought. They're going back and they're 
triple checking all of that, okay? Let's assume they don't come up with anything that changes the predicted value of this G factor, right? If that's the case and we get to five sigma, what does that mean? Well, what that means is it could mean a, a bunch of interesting stuff. What it could mean is that, you know, we've got some actually new physics going on. There's some, some physics that's going on there that we don't understand. It could mean that there's a particle that we're not seeing. In other words, that in this sort of virtual particle foam or soup or whatever you want to call it, there's a particle that's popping in and out of existence that we don't have in the standard model. And that's kind of what, you know, when you talk to the folks who say, hey, what do we think's going on? That's the thing that you hear most often is there's a particle. And of course, if there's a particle, that means there's got to be a mechanism for that particle. And that particle's got to have a way it interacts and a whole bunch of other stuff. That would be really, really interesting, right? Now, let's just say we get this result. What happens from there? Let's say we get the five sigma result. The guys at you know Fermilab and Brookhaven and CERN, if they 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 start to try to run parts of this grant, whoever, we get up to the five sigma number, and it gets accepted as this is a legitimate, valid result in the realm of particle physics. What's going to happen? Well, the thing that you you know. That some people say, is, oh, that means the model's failed. It's a broken model. It can't work. Understand, that's not how any of this stuff works in science. And we've, we've talked about this in great detail, right? The general theory of relativity, if you take, you know, you take your, your, your equations for the you know, field theory equations for the general theory of relativity, and you apply them to something in an area where there isn't warped space-time, the really cool thing is, is they, they sort of reduce down to Newton's universal law of gravitation. In other words, Newton's universal law of gravitation isn't destroyed. It is modified and accommodated. In other words, the, you know, a term that we used to use a lot back when I was, I was first getting into you know, computers and stuff like that, and you get a new operating system, you always ask, is it backwards compatible? Does it work with the stuff that comes before it? That's got to be a thing for a lot of these models in science. So, you know, the Dirac equation was the Schrodinger equation with, with relativistic considerations, which means if you talked about stuff that wasn't moving relativistically, the Dirac equation went back to me in the Schrodinger equation. When you look at renormalization, same kind of thing. You can show that the, 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 the methods of renormalization theory, when you take out some of these things, reduce back down to the Dirac equation. You know, when you get to the full, full version of the standard model of particle physics, it includes a whole bunch of other stuff. It's got to, it includes renormalization. Whatever model that you're going to sort of propose going forward that's going to replace the standard model, that model has to be able to account for everything that the standard model already correctly predicts. And it can't, it can't not do those things, right? You can't, you know, you can't have your new model says, well, I can account for this bump, but now I can't account for three things that the standard model co predicted correctly. That means your model is a failure, right? So the, the, all those observations that the standard model is built on, all those experiments that the standard model is built on, any new model has to take those into account. Now, it's possible that you could get one of these, you know, Thomas Kuhn style scientific revolutions where all of a sudden everything's just really, really not overthrown necessarily, but massively modified. But chances are what's more likely going to happen is you're going to see in, a, sort of a, an incremental change. You're going to see that, the, okay, wait a minute, we're going to make this change or we're going to add this particle. You know, that sort of thing. It's kind of like, you know, when Murray Gelman, you know, ever get in the particle zoo and all of a sudden he says, maybe there are these things, these particles, I'm going to call them quarks, and that will explain this. Maybe it'll be something like that. And that's probably more likely what it's going to be. Either way, I think it's going to be super, super interesting to see where this goes. Um, like I say, you can you can go out to, I think it's, um, you, the, if you're interested in looking at the Fermi Lab um, sort of results, it's news.fnal.gov, which is, you know, Fer, uh, the, Fermi, the Fermi National Acceler Laboratory, fnal.gov. Um, and they've got a new site there. Um, that's probably the best place to sort of get, get, get it straight from the horse's mouth. It's going to be a little more technical, um, but there's certainly, it looks like in what I've read, they've really tried to sort of boil this down a little bit. Um, and I think that's uh, pretty excited or exciting. I think that's really a... Uh, um, a neat thing that they're they're working on.
So if you want to kind of go, kind of go out and do a little more reading on that, I would really encourage that. Hopefully this ex explains a little bit of what's going on and gives you guys some context as, uh, as you go forward. Um, as we wrap up here, I hope everybody's doing well. Remember, get vaccinated, stay safe, and we'll, uh, we'll get all through all of this together. And hopefully, you know, we'll continue to get some really incredible scientific results as we go forward. So until next time, full sails on your journey.